we are starting a new series um, on one of our core values. And I just wanted to remind everyone what the purpose of the core values are. <clears throat> we want for people, when they come into this church, they know what we stand for. They know what we're believing. They know what we're working towards. We want them to know the culture that we're trying to establish. The first core value we talked about was genuine community. We said we're not people that go to church together, but we are a church family. We have to share each other's lives, be interested in each other outside of Saturdays. Hopefully we will lift each other's burdens, share each other's joys, and that we would work together for the common goal of building God's kingdom. Second core value was every member doing its part. And we said we are a community and a body, and it doesn't matter what part of the body you are, whether you are a nose hair or an earlobe or an eyebrow, this body depends on you for you to, for us to continue to grow and be healthy. If you consider yourself a member of this body, if you consider yourself a member of this body, then we're pre pleading with you, don't observe this church, but serve this church. Everyone here is invited. Then we talked about heavenly worship. You could be a community with every member doing something, and you might accomplish great things, but if worship is not the central part of your core, then you could be anything but a church. And it doesn't have to, sorry, if a community does not have as its central purpose worshiping God, who created us, redeemed us, sanctified us, and blessed us, then what we're doing is in vain. Our worship is not haphazard, it is not random. It was prescribed by God, it follows a heavenly pattern. The purpose of our worship is not to make me feel good, and it's not to make me happy. I am not the receiver of the worship. I am offering the worship, and God is our audience. We spoke about the liturgy to understand that what is required in the liturgy is for us all to participate. The assembly is a critical portion of the liturgy. And we decided that, not we decided, we understood that the liturgy is in its fullest when you participate, not for your sake, but for the sake of everyone. We're here to unite to each other. So if you're missing, you're not affecting you only, you're affecting the entire group. Now this next series is perfect for this season. I love this season. You know, there's so many great thoughts and memories. There's lots of traditions that come up. Um, you know, sometimes we like to put up Christmas lights. Sometimes we get a little excited and we don't know when to stop. Sometimes we try to have the cutest Christmas cards and we have epic failures. Um, but actually, things are just cute, right? Like, people are happy at this time. There are families that are together. Kids get excited. Kids getting excited makes parents excited. We have traditions like eating fish on Thanksgiving, just as the Coptic version of the Pilgrim story goes. I mean, this is a happiest time of the year, right? That's what they call it, the happiest time of the year. But I wonder, do I love this season for the wrong reason? We just started this last weekend. We started the season this last week, and I began to evaluate the beginning of this season with Thanksgiving. Something hit me. It's actually a religious holiday. Like, this country has set apart one day where the whole purpose is to give thanks to God. And on that day, amidst all the activities, we spent almost five, maybe even up to ten minutes thanking God before we went to town on that shrimp and fish. A whole day. And you know what? We were thankful for so many things. And I realize that Thanksgiving made me think more about things. We're always thankful for our food, our clothes, our house, our health, our family. We actually are thankful. I mean, everyone says, thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for us. We always say it with our mouths. Whether we do anything with it is oftentimes remaining to be seen. And what I realize 
is that on Thanksgiving Day, my focus was on the gifts. My focus was not on the giver. And I realized I love gifts. And then at the end of the day of Thanksgiving, you want to know what we did? Instead of continuing the day of Thanksgiving, sitting before the great provider and giver of all gifts, we planned on how we could get more gifts. Some of us slept early so that we could be ready the next day to get more gifts. It's really important for us to have gifts. I mean, we need to replace the ones that we bought last year, right? Some of the ones that we wore at least once already. I mean, they need to be replaced, right? Some of the things that we're replacing still work. I mean, oh, and wait, some of the gifts that we are replacing we got less than a year ago. We may have gotten them on our birthday or on Mother's Day or on Father's Day or every single sale day of the year which occur every single month. And in the end, we think about getting more gifts. We're so obsessed with gifts and stuff. I mean, it's sometimes for others and oftentimes for ourselves. For some reason, we feel like we need more stuff. And it's quite obvious we are a consumer society. I saw this quote on Facebook. I don't remember all of it, but I remember this one part. It says, we as a society are addicted to excess. I think, oh, sorry. I forgot to mention some of the gifts that we're trying to replace. Uh, sometimes you wonder where your family shops and buys their gifts. Um, but uh, I think... For some reason, we always feel like we need more. We truly are addicted to excess. And you're trying to say, this is the way I characterize myself. Sometimes I see myself more as a receiver than a giver. I feel like that's the way we are in this society. And some would say, Mark, really, are you being extreme? Let me ask if any of these things look familiar. These are first world problems. When I was a kid, no houses came with pantries. Now, houses come with pantries. And when you start your house, it looks like this. How long before it looks like this? It doesn't take long. There was no such thing as, I mean, how many people have this problem? Oh no, I have so many leftovers and not enough Tupperware. Do we have excess problems? This one, um, there was actually no male version of this. I don't know why, but um, how many of us look at our closets and say, you know what, I just don't have anything to wear, and yet our closets are not big enough to hold all our clothes? How many of us love deals? Like the deal of the day. You want to know what the problem with the deal of the day is? There's one every day. And so no matter how many deals you've got, no matter how much you're saving on that one deal, we continue to go after more and more deals. As if we need more stuff. Do you know how much money Americans will spend on Christmas this year? Any rough number? Oh. We're going to spend over $600 billion on Christmas. $600 billion on Christmas. Not the whole year. On Christmas. Knowing that we could eradicate all the diseases related to waterborne illnesses with like $15 billion. We could educate, provide primary education for the entire world with like $9 billion. And yet we're going to spend $600 billion. We could probably get rid of malaria and tuberculosis and AIDS. Do you know that we spend seven billion dollars on Halloween? Do you know that we spend 350 million dollars on pet costumes? Really? I mean, can you imagine 350 million dollars worth of this stuff? I mean, you'd say we're so ridiculous on what we spend our money on. Why are we like this? Why is it that we're like this? Well, let me tell you, it's part of the American culture and the American dream. 
I apparently have these out of order. Some of the definitions of the American dream are that we all have an equal opportunity to aspire to material success and attainment. This is part of the American dream, that we all have an equal opportunity to achieve material success and attainment. Or, another characteristic, it's a life of personal happiness and material comfort as traditionally sought by individuals in the U.S. This is part of the American dream. Now, as much as this is part of the American dream, and we are very fortunate to be here, we have to consider, is this consistent with God's dream? There's been a blending of the American culture with churches in America, and so many Christians here in America are confused. There's this concept called the prosperity gospel. So many churches are teaching this, that God wants you to have lots and lots of material blessings. He wants you to have larger homes and more cars and fancier vacations and nicer clothes. He wants you to have more incomes. He wants you to get more and more money in your job. He wants you to get raises. He wants you to have so much of this world. And although we may not preach that, oftentimes it's stuff that we pray for. It's still what we're looking after. Now, I'll be honest. God blesses people with wealth. God gives it to certain people. And is it bad that people have wealth and that God gave it to them? No, God gives people wealth. But he gives people wealth so that they can share it with his people. I just want you to realize that American dream is not equal to God's dream. And are we taught to pray, thy kingdom come or my kingdom come? Because what are we often looking for? How many of us spend our time on this earth trying to build our own kingdoms? You know, I think we're taught from when we're young, you know, like you got to get a good job so you can get a good income so you can buy a house. I would say most of my friends live in homes almost double the size of the homes we grew up in. But we didn't double the number of people in our families. Actually, our families are starting off smaller, right? We start off with one kid, two kids, and they're smaller than we were as teenagers, and yet we still feel like we need to get more. Now, I'm going to be honest. This talk is very sensitive for a lot of people to hear, and it's very convicting for me to give, considering I just bought a house several months ago. It's bigger than I ever thought I would buy. I am so guilty of this. And I feel like this plagues me all the time. But in this church, the focus will be God's kingdom, not our own. But let's not just blame the American dream. Let's take some responsibility. So on your handouts, there's some things that we need to realize that lead to this habit of wanting more. Why is it that we're always looking for excess? Number one, God has given us natural desires. He's given us desires which are necessary for survival. He wants you to want food. He wants you to want drink. He wants you to want shelter and clothing, even sex. The desire for sex is a gift. All of these are God-given gifts They're God-given desires. And yet, when we let the natural desires get out of control, they become unnatural and they become lustful. And the question is, do we control our desires or do our desires control us? Well, what is the answer? In 1 Corinthians 9, 25-27, St. Paul is talking about the gospel and his service and his ministry, and he says something that I think is the key. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Temperate, moderate. I'm not saying you have to be dirt poor, but we also have to learn to not be excessive in what we do. And when we don't control our body, and look at what St. Paul does. He says, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, something that's going to perish, 
we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Be moderate in all things and bring yourself into discipline. And so the church prescribes for us these disciplines of our bodies, of our desires, um, particularly during the fast. Each of those desires is disciplined during the fast, whether it be for food or for money or for sex or other pleasures. Those are all being disciplined during a fast. So ultimately, God gave us natural desires, but when we allow them to grow to be unnatural, we become lustful. Second thing is, uncontrolled desires lead to ever-growing discontent. When hunger gets out of control, we eat like starved lions, right? On Easter night at 12.05, you would act as if like these people had not seen food for 55 days. It's amazing, when we fast, what happens? We eat less, we eat smaller quantities, our bodies get used to it. Our bodies become content with less. But what do we do? We allow our desires to get out of control and then our bodies say, oh, well, you need more. And you need more and more. Because we're not controlling ourselves and then we have this constant desire and we're always hungry. There's a great verse in Ecclesiastes. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear with hearing. When you think about it, when you go into a restaurant with a menu, especially when it has pictures on the menu, what do you want to order? The whole menu. When you look at Pinterest and you see beautiful homes and beautiful decor, what do you want? Every single thing on Pinterest. It's the same thing with pornography. And it's not like one image is enough. Your body says you want more and more. And the thing I realize is the more I look at the things of this world, the more I want the things of this world. The more we see more, the more we want more. The more we see more, and I think we love looking at amazing things on this earth, and so we allow ourselves to feel not satisfied because there could always be something more. St. Paul in Philippians says this, not that I speak in regards to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. St. Paul says, I don't need more. I have learned to accept what I have, I've learned to become content. And godliness with contentment is great gain, as we're going to talk about. But we realize that there's a great dissatisfaction when we let our uncontrolled, our desires get out of control. The third thing that I think is our problem, why we're always looking for excess, is we haven't defined need correctly. How many times have we said, oh, I am starving? I really need food. How many of us said, oh man, I don't have any shoes. I need more shoes. How many of us said, I need the next Apple product. We constantly confuse need with want or desire or lust. I think we use the word need to satisfy ourselves. But I think if you were to look at any of these people defining their needs, needs are what? Look what St. Paul says in 1 Timothy. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and is certain we can bring nothing out. 
and having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. If we had just learned to be content, necessity actually is a survival thing. Let's stop using the word need. Let's start using the word want. I want more. Let's, let's face the reality. Let's not cover it. The problem is, we just aren't content. Number four, we're not satisfied with what God has given us. We're trying to fill an eternal hunger by temporary means. You ever thought about this? I love this verse in Jeremiah 2.13. It says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've honed themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. We are trying to stuff our lives with things that can hold no water. And the thirst lingers and lingers. And God says, I am a fountain of living water. How many of us could say, I could lose everything. I would consider everything as rubbish. Just like St. Paul said, I'm willing to suffer the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish just so that I could gain Christ and the knowledge of Him. How many of us have said, man, I could live in the smallest pit of the earth as long as God was with me? Pope Shenouda in his book, Release of the Spirit, there's this great chapter. It's like a very personal thing, but he says, I only want to be where you are. He says, if you were in Hades, I would want to be there. And if you were in heaven, I would want to be there. Wherever you are, I want to be. Because you are my satisfaction. You are my all in all. You are my everything. When you have your everything, what does the rest look like? Rubbish. The problem is, how many of us really have not been satisfied with God? Maybe the reason we're continuing to yearn is because we're trying to fill an eternal hole with trinkets. Number five. We trust in provisions, not the provider. I mean, I'm a parent. I've got kids that I expect or hope or pray will have to maybe fast that they'll go to college. So, I mean, I need to have a 529K, right? And then I need to... Uh, retire, so I need to have a 401k, and you know, maybe for taxes, I might have an LLC, and I have all these things I have to trust, and I have to get all this money so that I can be secure for my kids when they go to college, and when they get married, and when they buy a home, and when I'm going to retire, I need all this stuff for me so that I can secure myself. Isn't that a concern for a lot of us? That I need to get all this stuff so that I can take care of my family's needs. Did anyone ever worry that you were going to give away so much that you were going to end up not having anything for yourself? And I say, oh man, I got to stop giving, so I'm going, to, I'm going to be broke. I mean, most people don't get broke by giving, they actually become richer. They become richer by giving. Giving is not a cause for insecurity. It is a cure of it. Anne Frank, that lady that was in, the young lady that was uh, at the time of the Holocaust and that was hiding, she said, no one has ever become poor by giving. We are trusting in things, not God. Someone said, if you had to live hand to mouth, why would you be sad if the only hand that was providing was God's? If God's was the hand that was feeding you, and all your dependence was on Him, would it be a problem? I'll be honest, this is something that I struggle with. I wonder if we put more trust in the Almighty Dollar than we do God. Number six. We have a sense of entitlement. A sense that what you have, God gave you, 
and he wants you to have it for you. It's interesting. Uh, I heard, I read this story. It's it's an example, but someone was on an island with nine other people. They were on a deserted island, um, very meager. Uh, opportunities on the island, not a lot of food, no clean water, not much shelter. And then one of them prayed, he got a gift. He got a basket that had everything he needed. Food and water and a way to distill the water and like something for fire. And guess what he did? He took it and he used it for himself. I mean, that's what he would want. You'd think God would want, right? He prayed, he got it, he should use it for himself. What should the other nine people do? Say their own prayers. I mean, let them get their own stuff, right? The thing is, we feel entitled, we feel as though God gave us things for us to use for us, as opposed to realizing that these are God's things that He's allowing us to hold and to invest according to His will. If you went and took your money and gave it to a stockbroker and said, listen... I want you to invest this. And the next thing he did was he went and bought himself a car and you had nothing. He said, well, you gave me the money. I mean, you put it in my hands. See, yeah, I understand I put it in your hands, but it wasn't for you. It was my money. And I want you to invest it for my purposes. When was the last time? Most of us get paid twice a month. Whether it be for 15th, 1st and 15th or 5th and 20th. How many of you look in your account on the 5th and the 20th and say, Thank you, God, for putting stuff into my account. What do you want me to do with this money? When was the last time on payday you asked God, What do you want me to do with this money? Or we just said, Oh, yes, I got more money. We're entitled. And why do we feel as though God wants us to have more than the hungry people in Sudan. Why do you think God wants your children to have clean drinking water and not the people in India? Why do you think God would want you to have a larger home than the people in Congo? Like, Why do we feel that God has chosen to bless us more than the rest of the world? You want to know how much we consume? The top... 20% of the world consumes, you know, what percentage of the earth's resources? 20% consumes 86% of the world's resources. America consumes 25% of the world's food. And we are 4.5% the world's population. Why? Why do we feel as though we deserve to have it all? That God wanted it to be for us only. And He does want it to be for us. And for everyone. Even those who don't know Him, they are still His children. We need to get over this sense of entitlement that God has given me things and they're for me. What I need to understand is God has allowed me to watch over His things and I need to use them for Him. I guess the last thing is... I didn't have a Bible verse for this. I think we're just plain selfish. I mean, when I look at it, I want my happiness. I want my comfort. I want my pleasure. I want my joy. I want my security. Let's face the facts. These are why we always feel like we need more. So I'm going to end here. I'm actually not going to read this, but the lukewarm church. If you go to Revelations chapter 3, it talks about the lukewarm church. And this is something that we in this church are going to try to fight. The lukewarm church was the church of Laodicea. I guess I'm going to read it. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich. I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. 
I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and that you may be clothed and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. The Laodiceans were a wealthy church. They had very good um, products that they were producing in Laodicea that they were very well off. And the well off church, God rebuked them more than everyone else. He actually didn't say any of their good works. All the other ones, he says, I know the good things. You, he didn't say anything here. He just says, you're just lukewarm. Remember when we were in Africa, we were baptizing, you know, a bunch of people. And we were in this, like, church that didn't even have, like, pews. And not even the walls were all done. And one of, one of the people said, you know, how come we're going to baptize these people in this church? You know, it's like, it's like not honoring, you know. And, and the bishop said, you know what? A rich church is a cold church. A poor church is a warm church. I don't want us to be like all these other churches in America where we spend millions and millions of dollars on a huge building to serve us. Rather, let's be content with less so that we could be working for God's kingdom. So, last thing, the giving principles. These are some of the things that we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. The best givers are the ones who feel as though they've received the most. You know the story of the sinner woman and the Pharisee, the one who breaks into the house and she washes Christ's feet, wipes them with her tears and the hair of her head. You know that woman? And Simon says, how could you let this person do this? And Christ tells the story of two people that owed him two debts. And then this is what Christ said. He says the two debtors um, were both freely forgiven. And then he says, one owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? He says, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. The person who felt that they were forgiven the most showed the most love. Giving becomes so easy when you realize how much God has already given you. How much would you pay if this was not offered to you? For salvation. How much would you pay for forgiveness of sins? How much would you pay to be a part of God's family if it wasn't freely given to you? You say, oh, I'd pay anything for me and my family to go to heaven. What if we say, well, it's already given to you? Would you still pay anything? Well, no, then uh, I mean, I, I mean, I would just use it for me, right? Or... Since I have the most important thing, maybe I'd be more willing to give. Second thing is, seeing that I've received more than I deserve, I will learn to be content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I once gave this challenge at St. John Church. I said, what if, I know this is crazy, what if I said, don't go buy more food? What if I said, Eat the food you already have. I know it's crazy. What if you ate the food that was already in your pantry? Every Egyptian family in America. This doesn't happen in Egypt. Every Egyptian family has two refrigerators. By the time you make it out to the refrigerator in the garage and you open the freezer, you find things that say expires in 2006. Why? What if we use the things, that, what if we were just content? What if I said, don't buy anything for the next few weeks? There was an article that came out, I just saw it on Facebook yesterday, that said, your kids will be happier when you give them less. It's this lady who reviews toys. 
And she says, I found out I could give them all the toys that I test. I found out they were a lot more happier when they had less. And when they got something, they appreciated it more. People say you will be happier and more content with less. Mo money, mo problems. Right? This occurred to me that I was reading in Colossians the other day. It says, you know, let your mind be on things above, not on things of the earth. And I thought, man, the things that I get most anxious about are the things on this earth. When I think about heaven, I don't worry at all. If I was just content with what I have. Happiness, there's so many posters that say, happiness is not having the things that you want. It's wanting the things that you have. Number three, contentment will be liberating from desires to acquire more, acquire more for me. Once I'm content, I realize I don't need more. And since I don't need more, if I have more than I need, I'll even be more willing to give. And if I'm a cheerful and generous giver, guess what? I'm going to be giving. And if I'm a cheerful and generous giver, guess what's going to happen? God will take care of all my needs. In 2 Corinthians 6, this is what he says. 2 Corinthians 9. I love this. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Meaning if you don't give much, you're going to reap little. And he who sows bountifully, if you throw lots of seeds, you will reap bountifully. He says, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Like we say in the liturgy, God could make everything in heaven abound towards you so that you would always have enough to do God's work. It says, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for su food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. If I give cheerfully, God will always take care of my needs. God has so much wealth that He's trying to distribute to the needy and He's looking for people that are good distributors, that are good stewards. So I guess we should all realize that it is clearly more blessed to give than to receive. So I guess the last thing we need to say is this. The goal of this church we're not going to be just receivers. We're not going to be takers. We're not going to be consumers. We're not going to be hoarders. We want to be known as extremely generous givers. That's the culture of this church. That I want when people come here, they say, man, this church gives. And we'll discuss some examples of giving next week. I really want you to think about are you a receiver or are you a giver? Now I'll be honest. I realize everyone here is a giver. Everyone here, I know you. You are givers. But are you receivers more than givers? Are you extremely generous givers or do you just give? We're not going to settle. I pray that God will open our minds, our hearts, our wallets... Help us let go of our trust in provisions, our need for excess, and finally learn to be content with Him.